Okay, we might get the session started. Um, I think we'll probably have a few stragglers coming in from afternoon tea. Um, so welcome everyone to the final session for the first day of the ASM. Um, this session is um, a really unique session where we're actually following the story of um, the Pinery bushfires that happened um, in South Australia and I can't remember the year they happened. I'm sure that these guys are going to... 2015. 2015. Um, and so we're going, to, we're going to start with our first two speakers, um, Helen Hennessy and Brenton Hasty. Um, so Brenton is um, a commander and Helen is a community engagement officer uh, for the South Australian Country Fire Service Region 2. Their areas cover the northern Adelaide Hills, Barossa, Mid-North and York Peninsula. Um, Brenton has a background uh, as a volunteer firefighter and has worked both for fire agencies here in SA and in Victoria. Um, and he, on the day of the Pinery Fire, he was uh, one of the earliest incident controllers located at Balaclava. Um, Helen comes from a communication and community development background, having worked in the private sector and the state government and local government sectors. And on the day of the Pinery Fire, she was working at the Regional Public Information Officer. So thank you very much and welcome. Cool, thank you for that. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll launch straight in. Uh, so I think I've got about 20 minutes. This presentation normally goes a little bit longer than that, so uh, uh, I will uh, push, push through, so bear with me. Uh, so the Pinery Bushfire uh, was, uh, was three years ago. Uh, it was the, uh, one of the largest grass and crop fires uh, South Australia has seen for, uh, for, for, close to, for close to 20 years. It occurred very, uh, very early in the season, uh, so a November fire when uh, it was a good season for, for farmers, so there was a high levels of crop on the ground. Uh, and we, we had some uh, fairly extreme weather uh, come through, so a, a hot, dry, uh, hot, dry, windy day. Uh, in a single afternoon, there was uh, 8, uh, sorry, 82,500 hectares uh, burnt, and, uh, and tragically, two lives were lost uh, as a result of the fire. Uh, five people were, were critically burnt, and uh, we'll, we'll hear from uh, the story of one of those uh, this afternoon. Uh, numerous properties were, were destroyed, um, and uh, the, the fire uh, initially burnt uh, in, a, in a southerly direction, then with the wind change, which is a fairly common feature of, uh, of bushfires across southern Australia, the, uh, the, the fire started burning in an easterly direction. That's one of the, the key danger times of, uh, of a bushfire, which we'll, we'll talk, about, uh, talk about in a second. As uh, so the fire started just after, just after midday, um, we had uh, aircraft deployed within, uh, within about 15 minutes. Um, aircraft, uh, there's a misconception that they're able to put out the fire. Aircraft, if they get there quick enough, are able to hold it until ground crews get there, but uh, uh, the fire on this occasion was just, just burning too quick, so uh, the, the aircraft had very little effect. Uh, we started focusing on uh, issuing advice to the community, which is one of our key tactics when, uh, when we're unable to actually put out the fire. Uh, so we, we issued uh, warning messages um, and used the emergency alert system very quickly soon after that. Uh, in the end, we needed crews to come over from interstates. So we had CFA crews from, from Victoria uh, uh, come over the day after the, the Pinery Fire, um, and we managed to declare it to, uh, contained after two days, uh, but we, we uh, were working on it for some time after to, to get full control of the fire. Uh, so yeah, the summary, um, 
uh, as I said, uh, 82,500 hectares, uh, which means there's a perimeter of 265 kilometres, which means our crews had to work our way around the entire perimeter, making sure the fire was, was out and didn't escape. Uh, we had 1,700 crews from both CFS, uh, MFS, Department of Environment, Forestry, um, as I said, CFA, and all the support agencies, SAS, uh, South Australian Police, um, St John's, uh, Red Cross. Um, and yeah, as I said, 16 aircraft were involved, but on the first day they unfortunately had very, uh, very little impact. Uh, summary of the, the, the losses there, as I said, uh, there was nine, uh, 90 injuries, five of those were, were unfortunately uh, quite, quite serious injuries, and a uh, high level of stock loss, obviously being a farming part of the world as well, so uh, really a hard hit for the, for the farmers in the area in terms of loss of crop and, uh, and, and stock. And some of those communities are, are still struggling to, to recover today, but uh, starting to get on their feet. So just some photos of the, the scale of the fire. Um, so that's a photo from the Channel 9 chopper on uh, one of the, the flanks looking towards the, the point of origin. You can see that uh, you know, when fires get of this scale, there is just simply uh, nothing we can do. Um, our focus as a fire agency is to protect critical people, hospitals, schools, critical infrastructure. Um, we have very little ability to actually control fires of that sort until the weather conditions actually, uh, actually abate. Uh, so a photo of, of uh, some of the assets under threat, and uh, you, you'll struggle to find a, a fire truck there. Um, you know, we're fairly open to the community. There's not enough fire trucks for the number of houses that come under threat for these sort of events. So um, there's a huge reliance on individuals to have uh, good preparation around their homes to, to ensure that their home survives uh, without fire services being in attendance. Um, lots of people found they called triple O, and whilst the, the call may have been answered, um, uh, fire uh, didn't have spare appliances. And if you, uh, you were injured, unfortunately, SAS um, as an ambulance service won't go into a fire ground. So um, communities and, and injured people were, were very much uh, on their own. That's a photo of the wind conditions on the day. So extreme winds um, nearing 100 kilometres an hour. Uh, the raised dust meant that uh, it was very hard to see what was going on. We had multiple uh, crew, CFS crews who were caught in the path of the fire um, because the fire essentially emerged through the dust. And there was lots of footage on the, on the news at the time that... Uh, it went from being dusty to suddenly having a fire there. So people didn't know where the fire was and members of the public didn't realise how much danger they were actually in. Uh, that's a photo of uh, uh, Malala. Um, it's about two hours into the fire and the reason I know it's two hours into the fire because that red ute parked that the stops on there happens to be mine trying to get to the incident control centre for just a coincidence there. But... Uh, uh, the region was already dealing with another significant fire in Clare, so the closest incident management resources uh, actually came from uh, the southern Adelaide Hills, which is where I was based. Um, I was a volunteer with the, the service at that stage. I'm now uh, a paid staff member, but uh, uh, it took two hours for, for incident management resources to get there because of the sheer number of fires we had to, had to deal with on the day. So a uh, very difficult day for everyone involved. So what you see in the, the grey... Uh, uh, Scuggled out area is the uh, area of the fire. Um, and looking at the time there, that's uh, uh, about an hour. I can't actually read that. Uh, hour. Yeah, hour and, hour and 10 minutes after the, the fire started. Uh, the next uh, shot just shows that it continued to, um, to expand in a southerly direction. And as I said, the, the wind change is the key factor for, for bushfires in southern Australia. That um, you can be standing next to a fire, the fire activity on the edge of the fire is quite low and then the wind changes and suddenly there's a fire front heading towards you and it happens instantaneously. There's been more firefighters and, and people killed immediately after the wind change than at any other time during how a, how a bushfire generally spreads, uh, spreads in this part of the world. And that's, that's how big it ended up. So uh, um, at its peak it was burning uh, 235 hectares a minute uh, was its rate of spread. Um, it had an average forward rate of spread of 30 kilometres an hour, but uh, under peak winds it was actually burning at 80 k's an hour. So uh, if you're in front of the fire, if you're in the wrong spot, there was no, out, no outrunning it, and, and unfortunately that's why people were caught. Behind the scenes there's a whole layer, uh, levels of multiple uh, parts of uh, bureaucracy that, that tries to, and I say that in the nicest possible way, that tries to, to manage incidents of, uh, of this sort of scale. There's coordination between uh, all the fire agencies, Police, which are the key um, coordinator, coordinating agency, and uh, the ambulance service as well to try to coordinate how do we or the police get injured people out of the burnt area to a safe location for SAS to then be able to transport uh, patients to hospital 
Um, injured people, unfortunately, had to go north in this occasion, away from, obviously, the burns unit at, uh, at the Royal Adelaide Hospital, and uh, very, very difficult to, to coordinate that. We had people on the back of fire trucks, people in the back of police cars, and people making their, uh, their own way on, on private vehicles. So, a very uh, chaotic scene. And these people that essentially turn up at a local hospital, which um, you'll, you'll hear about uh, later on. Uh, just a bit about the, the um, command centre at Region 2. That's the centre that I, I now manage. Um, the, we, we were open 24-7 uh, for eight days straight. Uh, and we had sort of 30 staff and volunteers trying to coordinate both the Pinery Fire and the other jobs that were going on. Um, and our main role is, is community information, which Helen will talk about in a second. So um, we try to get the right resources to the incident controllers to do something about the fire, but um, all those radio messages that interrupt the cricket, if you're a cricket fan, all summer long, um, all the things that come across Facebook and all our other information sources are, are generated out of the, the command centre located at Roseworthy. And there was a time there that uh, um, where our command centre was at the time was actually going to come under threat from the fire as well. Uh, we've also got a state command centre located in Weymouth Strait. Um, the command centre was activated because of the, the extreme conditions and that's a key place where we try to coordinate uh, the information about how many people might be injured, where the fire's going to stop, across to police and health so they can put preparations in place for, for what the outcome of the fire might be. And I'll hand over to Helen now. Thank you. So yes, my role as Community Information Officer means that I'm out in the community even before fires, so I go out and talk to people in their backyard or at their organisation and we do a lot of preparation about being red, bushfire ready. But when we go operational, when there are fires or when we're expecting fires, my role changes and I become what's called a Public Information Officer because the minute, as Brenton said, the minute we're starting to think about fighting fires, we're informing the public that it, we do that simultaneously so that the public is as well aware of what they need to do with their own plan um, while we're trying to deal with the, the fire and the, the other possibilities. So on that particular day, um, as Brenton said, we had a, a fire up at Clare. Um, we threw a lot of things at that and that, looked, that was pulled up. We had another fire down at Penfold, which is close to the city. And then while all that's going on and there's people all over the place, there was this little fire at Pinery. And we have a, there's a, an Australian standard that we name our fires after wherever it starts. And, and so the people don't know where that might be. Um, a lot of people have never heard of Pinery. It's, it's not really a village, it's just a location. It's similar, we've had fires at um, Samson Flat and Bangor and whatever. Um, they become notorious afterwards. Anyway, so on that day, we do start to send messages out. Um, we sent out, as you can see, uh, uh, about 44. Um, and we have different ranges of um, messages. Um, the, the, obviously, the most urgent is the emergency warning, but we send out watch and act and bushfire advices. So a lot of the work I'm doing beforehand is trying to explain to the public what that's about and what what people need to understand um, so that they are prepared. And a lot of our marketing material and our publications um, are informing people of that as well. Because on the incident, we'll all panic, and that's where your prior preparation comes into place. <clears throat> we also sent out emergency alert, which most of the public knows is the phone message. It's a pre-recorded message or it's a text message, and that's sent directly to people in the path. So all the other messages that come across the radio are broad. They can, you can be heard around the state. These phone messages are directed directly towards the people in the path. But like all systems, they require a certain amount of time and validation and human input. And in that day, with those winds, we were well behind. We were well behind where we thought the fire might be. It was, we were racing to try and discover where the fire was and where it was going. Um, for all of that, though, people did get the messages, which for some people was a good thing. For some, th for some people, it would have been, I don't understand, what, is, what am I supposed to do now? Um, we, our website, where we put, post all our information, gets an enormous hit. We, actually, our website sits outside the normal um, South Australian government setup because it gets absolutely hammered. We also use Facebook and Twitter. Um, and that is, again, hitting a lot of people. Um, a lot of the younger demographics are using... Uh, dem a lot of people at younger ages are now using that. And, of course, they then on send that information as well, so that's quite a useful way. Um, so we're using all of those. We do have a bushfire hotline number, which I've just found one of my colleagues has um, 
going to be involved with this year, where we have people sitting in Adelaide talking to people. So that reassurance of a, a real life person answering your questions, providing you information, is greatly um, a great reassurance to people as well. Um, and on that particular day, um, in 11 hours, they had, you know, they were getting a huge amount of phone calls coming in, and they can be quick reassurance to quite a detailed trying to um, inform people what to do. Another thing we do is hold community meetings because people want to come together quite quickly and listen and be told and network. So on from the Pinery, we had one immediately at Gawla and Balaclava um, and then through to Malala and Kapunda. And you can see the numbers there, how people are increasing. So people may well have attended more than one. It's again, it's both, it's both gaining information, but it's also coming together as a, an affected and traumatised community. Um, and I, I was at the Kapunda one where the school particularly um, needed to come together for that. Um, and we use all the normal things, our chief officer and, uh, and other senior members of both the government and other agencies go onto the media. Um, because that was in November, we were actually picking up um, international interest in that as well, so um, it was quite stunning. Um, and I think most people in Australia suddenly realised what was happening. Um, yeah. Lots of media intention. Then, of course, we go into the relief recovery. So relief for us almost starts immediately. Um, so people who are affected need to be able to go somewhere. Um, and then that morphs into a recovery session. And the recovery actually lasted for, formally, for two years. There was recovery support out in that area. Um, but I know for sure that there are still recovery agencies working out there. A lot of counselling and a lot of um, trauma is still being dealt with as people adjust to a completely different point of life. Um, again, this is all pre-set up. There's a lot of coordination that happens before, both with the, non, the government and the non-government agencies, so that um, we learn from what happens and we're better prepared for next time, because it's all going to happen as smoothly and as seamlessly as possible. Um, and then the lovely thing about social media is that the public can come back with their sense of appreciation, and that is really rewarding for our volunteers and one of the, my functions that we do is we actually monitor the Facebook and we'll take, print it out and go and stick it where the brigades are having their, you know, their stand down so they might be having a meal and some coffee and they can actually read live or by printed means at least this type of, um, and that's because they've, they're also, I mean, it's often their community that they're dealing with so it does, it, that positive feedback is really, really useful. Um, and everything, like every organisation, we're a learning organisation, so the research starts almost immediately. We do uh, what was called a lessons learnt, where everyone involved, the volunteers, the staff and everyone else sits down and we actually um, we visit what happened, try and decide how we could do improve, and then we do implement that. And I've worked for a number of different sectors, and I've got to tell you, it really is um, a genuine thing. And you can see from year to year that we are changing learning from what, we, what we've been through. Um, so yes, I think that's much the same. Um, we also were gifted with people who wanted to share their experiences. So this gentleman, Ian, um, he actually lives at a tiny little place between Roseworthy and Hamley Bridge called Magdala, and he came through at one of the earliest uh, community meetings and said, I've got some footage would you like my footage? Um, and our media people went out and interviewed him and he went up as a bit of a YouTube discussion, uh, YouTube session on our website and then it was shared across a, a number of other agencies where he talked about what happened to him on the day and what he did. And there's nothing like public to public um, teaching. Um, um, yeah, and that was really, really generous. There was a number of people who did that. Um, that's actually one of the photos. Uh, Ian is a, one of those um, light aircraft, you know, the really, really light aircraft um, pilots. So that is his property. So he knows he was lucky and he did do some prior preparation, but a lot of comes into luck. Um, he was able to help his neighbours um, during the fire and then he was really instrumental in helping his neighbours um, after um, they came together and had a couple of barbecues and just talked and, and bonded. And these are people that may have only known each other for waving beforehand because you go out and live in country like that because you want a bit of space and privacy. 
but it's amazing how quickly those communities come together to support um, or just to offer help or put people in touch with, with help that they're going to need. Um, there were some amazing men's health initiatives that came out, very informal. They wouldn't have named themselves men's health initiatives, but they did. Um, blokes knew that blokes were not doing so well and there was lots of informal gatherings of blokes. Um, so this is the unit that I work for. As I say, we, we run all type of meetings, information sessions, do a whole pile of stuff in preparation, but then we, we get involved. And, of course, once a, a community has been affected by fire, then they're much more... They're really interested. And I've spent the next two to three years after, since then, going back into these um, fire-affected communities and, and talking to people because... Now it's their experience and they never want to go through it again, so what should they do next time? Um, and one of our programs is called Community Fire Safe Groups and that's based on, on the bring neighbours together and they will be the most useful um, form of network you can create. And they're, sometimes they're literally neighbours, street neighbours, but in these areas they might be farming communities. So it might be, and I've got one that's north of Kapunda, there's 24 farming families, but they're spatially quite you know, it's quite spread out, but they keep in contact by radio and that's how they can alert each other and check on each other as well. Um, and that's how we, we have a whole pile of um, ways you can contact us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Helen and Brenton. That's um, just staggering, I think, the scale of, of those fires. Um, are there any questions? I think I had one. Helen, you touched on... Um, <laughs> Helen's popped down. You, you touched on that you um, you met and sort of looked at lessons learned. What was the main lesson learned from these fires? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, so, look, the, the key lesson for, for the CFS was to uh, have our incident management uh, start more quickly. So, uh, as I said, it was two hours before I got there as one of the first... Uh, incident controllers going into an incident control centre. So we've increased the number of resources on days like that that are sitting there ready to go. Uh, we've made vast improvements to all our community information and warnings uh, type stuff as well. Um, because Pinery wasn't a, a known location, now all our warnings come out with maps and, and show uh, if you live in this area that you might, uh, you might come under threat as well. Great. Thank you. Just a question at the back. Sure. So a uh, contained fire means that we've essentially stopped the forward spread of the fire, so the, uh, the fire is no longer increasing in size. Uh, controlled means that we're now confident that uh, uh, we've got the fire uh, under control uh, and it's less likely to escape um, over the coming days. It's sort of a bit of a, a, a stage that, uh, yeah, contained is you're no longer under immediate threat and control means that we're starting to get confident that it won't escape if the, the winds pick up or... Excellent. Thank you very much, Helen and Brenton.